Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We will start our session. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, assalamu alaikum. Peace and blessings be upon you. Uh, dear guests and our members, thank you very much for joining us. Today is Saturday, and I know the guests who have joined us, they have their personal commitments with their families and friends, and they chose to be with us today, and that speaks volume for you, that how much you care about your community. I am Fateh Qurashi. I am the Public Affairs Director, volunteer for the Los Angeles chapter, and I welcome you on behalf of Amdiya Muslim community. Uh, today is the annual Iftar dinner, and in our audience today we have lots of engineers, doctors, teachers, professors, and lawyers, attorneys, and we want to thank them for being here. Since it's the short session, uh, we open fast today at uh, 6.59, about 7 p.m. tonight. And round about that time, there will be call for prayers, we call azan. And at that time, all the members, they will proceed to the prayer hall, out that right side of my side, to the corridor, to the prayer hall. And if any of our guests want to follow or see how we pray, and see the prayer hall, you're most welcome to do that. The only request I have is to please take off your shoes once you enter the prayer hall. And uh, for the restroom areas, for the ladies' room, to my right, immediate to the right of the door is the ladies' room, and somebody can definitely help them. And for men's, if you go straight in the corridor, towards the end of the corridor, that's the men's room. And we have about five to 10 minutes each for every speaker. And uh, please stick with your time, so don't come in way of some very hungry people. And you know what happened. So with that said, I will request we start our session with the recitation of Holy Quran. And I will ask Ansari um, Sahib to please come and recite some verses of the Holy Quran and translate. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا كتب عليكم السيام كما كتب على الذين من قبلكم لعلكم تتقون أياما معدودات فَمَنْ كَانَ مِنْكُمْ مَرِيدًا أَوْ عَلَى سَفَرٍ فَعِدَّةٌ مِنْ أَيَّامٍ أُخَرٍ وَعَلَى الَّذِينَ يُتِيقُونَهُ فِدْيَةٌ طَعَامُ مِسْكِينَ فَمَنْ تَتَوَّ خَيْرًا فَهُوَ خَيْرُ اللَّهِ وَأَنْ تَسُومُوا خَيْرُ لَكُمْ مِنْ كُنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ شَهْرُ رَمَدَانَ الَّذِي أُنزِلَ فِيهِ الْقُرْآنُ هدى للناس وبينات من الهدى والفرقان فمن شهد منكم الشهر فليسم ومن كان مريدا أو على سفر فعدة من أيام أخر يريد الله بكم اليسر بلا يريد بكم الأسرة 
ولی تکمل الادتا ولی تکبر اللہ علی ما حداکم ولعلکم تشکرون وَإِذَا سَعَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ اُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّعَائِ اِذَا دَعَانِ فَلْيَسْتَجِيبُ لِي وَلْيُؤْمِنُ بِي لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْشُدُونَ I just recited verses 184 through 187 of the second chapter of the Holy Quran and the translation is as follows. I seek refuge in Allah from Satan, the rejected. In the name of Allah, the gracious, the merciful. O ye who believe, fasting is prescribed for you as it was prescribed for those before you so that you may become righteous. The, pre the prescribed fasting is for a fixed number of days, but whoso among you is sick or is on a journey, shall fast the same number of other days. And for those who are able to fast only with great difficulty is an expiation, the feeding of a poor man. And whoso performs a good work with willing obedience, it is better for him. And fasting is good for you, if you only knew. The month of Ramadan is that in which the Quran was sent down as a guidance for mankind, with clear proofs of guidance and discrimination. Therefore, whosoever of you is present at home in this month, let him fast therein. But whoso is sick or is on a journey shall fast the same number of other days. Allah desires to give you facility and he desires not hardship for you, and that you may complete the number, and that you may exalt Allah for, for his having guided you, and that you may be grateful. And when my servants ask thee about me, say, I am near. I answer the prayer of the supplic supplicant when he prays to me, so they should hearken to me and believe in me that they may follow the right way. Thank you, Mr. Ansari, for reciting the Holy Quran and the translation. As I want to remind everyone that today's theme is Voices for Peace. And as Amdiya Muslim community, we very strongly condemn the killing of innocent women and children in the war happening in Gaza as we speak. We have the privilege to have food on our tables, but it is hurtful to say that there are children and women and innocent people are dying, and nobody, I shouldn't say nobody, a lot of people in this world are quiet. Our beloved holiness, Hazrat Mizza Masrur Ahmed, our spiritual leader, <coughs> I will share his video with you. In a recent peace symposium in Europe, he condemned the war happening in the Middle East as we speak, and very, in very strong words, he requested, he told the world leaders that this must stop. With that said, I will request our audio video team to please play the video scripts of uh, the symposium. In community, Hazrat Mirza Masrur Ahmed, may Allah be his helper, delivered the keynote address at the 18th National Peace Symposium UK. The event was attended by over a thousand people, including dignitaries and guests who had gathered from over 20 countries, comprising of ministers, ambassadors of state and members of parliament. During the proceedings, His Holiness presented Adi Roche, founder of the charity Chernobyl Children International, with the 2020 Ahmadiyya Muslim Prize for the Advancement of Peace. Similarly, His Holiness also presented David Spurdle, founder of the charity Stand By Me, 
with the 2023 Ahmadiyya Muslim Prize for the Advancement of Peace. In his address, His Holiness stated that for two decades he has urged governments, politicians and all people to play their respective roles in de-escalating world conflicts and bringing about peace in the world. For over two decades, I have urged governments, politicians and all people to play their roles in ensuring social cohesion of our individual societies and the wider peace and harmony of the world. I have expressed my views on how we can bring an end to all forms of warfare, whether conflicts fought falsely in the name of religion or those which are overtly geopolitical. I have not only spoken of the pressing need to end wars between nations, but also to tackle the frustrations that exist locally within communities and to strive for peace in those nations where civil wars or internal disputes are rife. His Holiness went on to reflect on whether there was any point in this gathering. He questioned what benefit the symposium would bring if those who hold power are intent on ignoring calls for peace. As I thought about today's event, I wonder whether there was any point in us gathering here again. What benefit was there for us to speak about peace and justice? If those with the power and ability to influence change were determined not to hear us, the stark reality is that even those institutions founded with the primary objective of maintaining the peace and security of the world are becoming increasingly irrelevant. For example, the United Nations has become a weak and almost powerless body where a few dominant nations wield all the power and easily override the views of the majority. Instead of deciding each issue based on its facts and merits, nations have formed alliances and vote according to their self-interests. Ultimately, critical decisions are made by a few privileged nations in whose hands rest the veto power. Hazur, may Allah be his helper, then prayed for the world to come to its senses and urged urgent action from policymakers to establish peace before it is too late. With all my heart, I hope and pray that before it is too late, the world comes to its senses and brings an end to the brutalities and wars taking place in the world. Certainly, it is my opinion that there should be a full ceasefire between Israel and Hamas or Palestine, and also in the war between Russia and Ukraine. Thereafter, instead of inciting their respective allies towards further warfare, all members of the international community should prioritize ensuring relief effort or stepped up to help those in desperate need and focus on bringing about a lasting and peaceful settlement. If instead we stand by and let these wars escalate further, countless more innocent lives will be lost. And surely history will judge us with contempt as the author of our own destruction and misery. In conclusion, Hazur may Allah be his helper, emphasized the need of the time and gave a call to all to focus their energies on working towards a world of hope and prosperity. Political leaders and those who have access to policymakers 
must take a long-term view of what is in the best interest of mankind, rather than being blinded by selfish desires to assert their superiority over others. We must all come together, setting aside national, political, and other vested interests for the greater good of humanity, and to ensure that we leave behind a prosperous world for our future generations. It is the need of the time that we must focus all our energies and efforts on establishing true peace so that we may live in a world of hope and prosperity. Hazur then led all present in a silent prayer. After the event, MTA News spoke with those in attendance to get their feedback on the event. It was music to my ears and also I felt very emotional because he is the only leader that I know or that I've come across that actually speaks it as it is. He speaks about the dangers of if we we ignore the uh, progression towards making war and more of a nuclear exchange, we ignore it at our peril. And the whole of civilization will pay the ultimate price. And I believe His Holiness has foreseen this in the last number of years. And I think people now are beginning to listen with a new set of ears because they understand that actually his vision of what, unless we bring about peace. So I just love the whole idea of a community being absolutely knitted together with one sole purpose, and that is the creation of world peace. I really thought his speech was thought-provoking. I think he's courageous to criticize uh, Israel and to criticize America. Um, these people are ruining the lives of thousands of children and uh, widows, uh, women. Uh, the devastation in Gaza is deplorable. Humanity should be ashamed of itself. And I really think His Holiness was brave in, in, in saying what he said in the way that he said it. And what he said is true. There's only one way forward, and that's through love and compassion and reaching out and bravery. His Holiness is always inspirational. I've had the huge honour to hear him at many peace symposiums. And I can tell you that they do make a difference. Politicians of all parties listen to him. I've had the huge honour to hear him here, but also meet him one-to-one. -one. And I've always welcomed his advice. Indeed, I've sought his advice on a number of awful wars we've had over the years. And with the horrific violence in Gaza, as well as the appalling war in Ukraine, we need world leaders like His Holiness to speak up. We need all politicians to listen hard and take action to get the peace we all, all want. Thank you for watching. Um, I apologize, I forgot to mention our vibrant Chino police officers who are able to join us as well. Thank you very much for coming. The Amdiya Muslim community has been involved um, all the time. This is not the first time, but we have been pushing peace throughout our existence. We have been going to Washington DC every year with all our public affair directors all across the United States. And we have been meeting with the Congress and the Senate in DC and in Sacramento and pleading them for peace and uh, to protect the innocent people who are being suffocated and compressed. And uh, they have been times when these people were even stopped from propagating their religion, practicing their religion. And we have been advocating this all along. So today, I just wanted to quickly summarize. There are a lot of things behind the scene that Amdiya Muslim community has been doing for years. In 9-11, uh, uh, we had been very, very actively 
<clears throat> gone very, very active in several areas, and I will mention a few. We have a division which, um, <clears throat> which serves Muslims for peace, Muslims for loyalty, Muslims for life, true Islam, Muslim for remembrance and supreme justice. Here in this picture you will see all the Muslim women, our women, Amdi women, stand on Westminster Bridge in solidarity with London terror attack victims, March of 26, 2017. And our kids, our young kids, adults, we support our law enforcement. We have a lot of members who are serving in law enforcement and in the military as we speak. And every 4th of July, we show our solidarity hand in hand with all the police officers. Here you will see our children participating in the 4th of July parade in San Jose, California. In Muslims for Life, as I mentioned, uh, we started a drive of collecting blood. Right after 9-11, there was a great shortage of blood and we collected since 9-11 we have several times a year blood drives all around United States of America, on the Capitol Hill, in LA, in Corona, in this masjid in Chino. And since 9-11, we have collected thousands and thousands and pints of blood and have been able to save hundreds and thousands of lives in return. Here in this picture, you will see a US member of Congress in the annual Muslim for Life American Red Cross, blood, Red Cross blood drive. Sorry, I can't speak with fasting. Mouth is too dry. <laughs> At the Capitol Hill, <clears throat> donating blood and following our lead. Amdiya Muslim Foundation founded two historical periodicals. I think uh, not everybody knows that. American Muslim periodical established in 1921 and the international Comparative Religious Periodical established in 1902. Our leader promotes just relations between nations. The video that you saw today on the Peace Symposium, His Holiness has been asking the world leaders time and time after. He has written books on peace, distributed it to them, written them personal letters, trying to show them where we standing today. He envisioned this many, many years ago. And he has been a big proponent of peace, pushing peace, meeting all these worldly leaders and the spiritual leaders, just to ask them to support him in the cause of peace. In United States, June of 27, 2012, he said, His Holiness said, peace and justice are inseparable. You cannot have one without the other. Yet in general, there's little doubt that restlessness and anxiety in, is increasing in the world and so disorder is spreading. This clearly pro proves that somewhere along the line, the requirements of justice are not being fulfilled. And that is a very serious thing to consider. And our leader warns for imminent global nuclear war. And as everybody can see, the world where we are heading. There's war in the Middle East. People are dying. And majority of the world is sitting quietly watching what is happening in front of them. How sad is that? In Japan, in November 25th, 2015, His Holiness said while visiting Japan, while perhaps the major powers keep nuclear weapons as a deterrent, there is no guarantee that the smaller countries will show such re restraint. We cannot take it for granted that they will never use nuclear weapons. Thus, it is clear that the world stands on the brink of disaster. And by the way, this is in 2015. And look where we are today. And like I said earlier, he has taken time for his very busy schedule to meet with the world leaders personally here you will see he's speaking with Trudeau in Canada, in Ottawa, Canada, November 26, 2016. And according to him, he says, all people should be granted true religious freedom. And this is on religious freedom around the world. And all people should have the right to peacefully practice their faiths and beliefs. 
government should not seek to interfere or legislate against peaceful held religious beliefs. We have been a very strong advocate of world peace. And I will, at this point, take liberty to put him on spot. We have a present among us as Mr. Amjad Mahmood Khan. He's an attorney, and he has been leading this cause for a very long time. And he has been fighting this, not only in the United States, but he has traveled all around the world to protect the innocent people who are being prosecuted without their any fault. Amjad Mahmood Khan sahab, can you please rise so I can have people recognize you? JazakAllah. Here we have, we advocate for the rights of others at uh, Rohanga Muslim refugee camps. Innocent people, innocent women and children were camped without any food and we fought for their cause. Ujugar Mu's crisis, we went to Washington DC and plead their case with the lawmakers with very hard work and with the Congress and the Senate, we have been established a, a caucus Congress advocate for Amdiya Muslims in Pakistan. And here are the list of all those congressmen who have signed and who really understand the difficulties for Amdi Muslims in Pakistan. And similarly, we have another caucus for Algerian Muslims. At this point, I will shift my attention to presenting the, some present, uh, presenters to you. As I mentioned earlier, we help in different causes and one of the department that we have is Humanity First. And we go all around the world helping people and in one such case where we have our doctor in-house, his name is Dr. Asad Khan, and he's an ophthalmologist with Kaiser Permanente in Orange County. He volunteers countless number of hours as a director of gift of sight program and travels all around the world for the organization called Humanity First USA. He also serves on national board of Amdiya Muslim Community USA. I request him to share with the audience some of the volunteer work he has recently done, I believe in Africa, if I'm not mistaken. Please welcome Dr. Asin Khan. Thank you. Yeah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. That's the Arabic Islamic greeting. May the peace and blessings and mercy of God be upon all of you. Um, are the slides projecting onto the screen? Okay. So uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Fateh Qureshi, for the kind invitation. And um, I'm certainly um, very grateful to all of the guests who've come today representing uh, different faiths. Um, you know, I can't help but notice that uh, in the table across from me is my friend Asif Arif, who's a lawyer. And whenever you're a doctor speaking in front of people, the last person you want to have right in the table in front of you is a lawyer, but fortunately you have armed police officers <laughs> <laughs> sitting next to him, so thank you for your service. And then to add to the intimidation, my respected father is literally the closest person to me, so we'll make this work somehow. So um, I've been asked to speak a little bit about Humanity First. So Humanity First is a nonprofit organization, an international organization that was founded in 1994, and it's a branch, it's an offshoot of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. But I think before, and this is not gonna be long, but before talking about humanity first, I think we should just talk in general about uh, the philosophy of service and of giving. Because we're in the time of Ramadan, the fasting month in Islam, and as we'll hear from other speakers and our respected missionary, uh, Ramadan is not just about fasting and not eating or drinking from sunrise to sunset. It's about uh, changing your way of life, of way of thinking of spending more time in prayer and meditation and reading Holy Scripture, but also in service, in serving others. Because serving others is, is the hallmark of Islam. And um, as I walked in, I had met people from, from different faiths, and it started getting me to think that uh, service to mankind and the concept of giving to others 
is not just unique to Islam, it's prevalent in all religions. So literally as um, Fatah was speaking, although I promise I was paying attention, I started Googling what other religions say about service. And what I found was fascinating that pretty much the same theme is found in all scriptures. For example, in the Baha'i faith, Baha'u'llah, he says, desire not for anyone the things you would not desire for yourself. Uh, Gautam Buddha, the prophet of Buddhism said, treat not others in ways that you yourself would find hurtful. In Matthew 7, 12, Jesus Christ, alayhi salam, says, in everything do to others as you would have them done to you. So the golden rule as we're taught. Uh, Confucius, one word which sums up the basis of all con uh, good conduct is loving kindness. In Hinduism, the scripture says, the sum of all duty is to do not to others what would cause pain if done to you. Uh, Jainism, you can go on and on. Sikhism, Judaism, what is hateful to you, do not do to your neighbor. This is in the Talmud. And so it's no surprise that the holy founder of Islam, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, may the peace and blessings of God be upon him. One of his famous hadiths is, not one of you truly believes until you wish for others what you wish for yourself. And he, we believe he was the last of the law-bearing prophets. And you can see how we're all, as brothers and sisters, we're bound in this common thread of service to humanity. And that's basically what Humanity First is founded on. So uh, in Islam, the, the basic teaching we have is that we have two rights. We have rights to God and we have rights to fellow man. So rights to God means that we pray five times a day, we fast, we do the pilgrimage, we pay charity to the poor. These are rights that we owe to God, to worship God. But we also have rights to mankind. We have to help our fellow man. That's our job description as Muslims. We can't ca call ourselves Muslims if we don't serve our fellow man. So in, again, in quoting the Holy Prophet Muhammad, may peace and blessings of God be upon him, he has famously sent, said, find me amongst the weak and poor. Surely you are provided for and helped only due to your support of the weak and deprived. In other words, God Almighty, he gives us all the bounties we have in life contingent upon how we treat those who are underserved, underrepresented, who are deprived. The founder of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, the promised Messiah of Islam, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, he rightfully said, to love mankind and to show compassion to others is an immense form of worship of God and an outstanding means of attaining his pleasure and rewards. Allah the Almighty, our God, repeatedly commands that irrespective of religion or ethnicity, you should love and com show compassion to all people. Allah commands us to feed the hungry, free those shackled in bondage, pay off the errors of those mired in debt, shoulder the burdens of others, and truly fulfill the duties owned to mankind. So this brings us to humanity first. The fourth successor of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, Hazrat Mirza Tahir Ahmad, uh, he founded Humanity First in 1994 um, in, in the uh, wake of the Bosnian War in Europe. And there were a lot of refugees who needed assistance. And so Humanity First was created out of that need to help those who were uh, victims of warfare. And he has famously said that the voluntary act of benevolence or the art of giving more than what is expected leads to the highest stage in human relations. So this photo you see here is the lobby of the newest hospital that was created by Humanity First in Guatemala. And because uh, Hazrat Mirza Tahir Ahmad Ramallah founded Humanity First, this beautiful quote along with this photo is, is in the lobby of the hospital and that was from an eye camp that we went to a couple of years ago. So this, is, this comes to what we do in Humanity First Gift of Sight. So I'm serving uh, Humanity First as a director of the Gift of Sight program. I'm an ophthalmologist, so I do eye surgery for a living. And there are millions of people around the world who are blind, but it's a reversible blindness. They have cataract or they simply need glasses and they can't see. And they don't have access to basic care. So in Humanity First, what we do, and I'm just a small component of a huge number of volunteers and doctors around the world who do this work, is that we go to underserved areas within the United States and abroad in other countries, and we uh, set up eye camps where we go for a week or two and we perform eye surgeries, and we take a lot of volunteers with us, and we spend several days performing hundreds of surgeries in the hopes of restoring vision for the underserved, and it's all free, um, without any charge, completely voluntary. And so this is an example of a gentleman that we took care of about five years ago in Guatemala. Uh, his name is Enrique. He's in the red, red um, sweater. He walked to the camp several miles. He didn't have transportation. 
Both him and his wife, sit, seating, seated beside him, both had cataract. Um, and you can see that both of them have stickers over one of their eyes, and that's a reminder for our team of which eye we're gonna be performing surgery on, and that's them waiting for the surgeries in the camp. There you see him on the left. You can kind of see, I don't know how the picture looks on the screen, but you can actually see the cataract. A cataract is when the, the natural clear lens of our eye becomes cloudy. So you can see that his right eye actually has a cataract. Um, in the top central photo, there's some volunteers. Uh, these are students, uh, medical students, even non-medical students who go with us and we train them how to put in IVs. And some of them are sitting in this room today actually. And then we make a makeshift operating room in this remote, um, in, in this particular case, it was in a remote village. Now we have an eye hospital where we perform these surgeries. And then there is Enrique um, after successful surgery with a patch on his eye and all of this equipment is taken from the United States. Uh, um, here's a volunteer, he's a member of our community, Iftikhar, I don't know if he's in the audience, that's him putting eye drops um, in a patient. It took him a while to learn how to put drops in a patient, but he did a pretty good job. Um, and uh, there's a photo of me and my mentor, Dr. Bouchard, who taught me cataract surgery in Chicago. Uh, he's come along on these trips and we're performing surgeries. And you can see we don't have even a basic operating room light overhead. So here we have just a basic desk lamp that we use to illuminate and, um, and make do with what we can over there uh, and try to maintain sterile precautions. And that's sort of the nature of how we do the surgeries in these camps. Um, there is that same gentleman, Iftikhar, with his three sons who went with us on a trip to Guatemala. Again, they might be in the crowd, not to put him on the spot. And the reason I like this photo is because um, the spirit of volunteering starts at a very young age. So those of you in the audience who have little children, you should take your children on trips or you should encourage them to go on, on service-related trips because that taste of service, if they enjoy that at a very young age, it'll, it'll perpetuate and then they'll pass that on to their generation. So I was very excited that my friend Iftikhar, who first on his own went on a trip, he took his three sons on the trip and, and they all enjoyed it and they all learned a lot from it. Um, here's an example of two twin brothers. Uh, they, they were born in Pakistan, but they've pretty much been raised in this mosque, uh, Wais and Nawaz, I don't even know if they're in the audience today. Um, and they've gone on these trips with me on separate occasions, not together. And they too learned a lot about medicine and eye surgery. What I find interesting about this photo is that um, the gentleman on the right, Awes, uh, he's now a physician. So clearly, or I hope this uh, trip that he took inspired him. Um, but his twin brother, Nawaz, is a foot specialist. So he literally picked the part of the body that is furthest from the eyeball. And, and that's what he's uh, making a living off of. So I clearly didn't do my job there, but they're both by the grace of God, doing very well, and they're very dedicated volunteers. So uh, you just heard, uh, uh, you just watched a video from His Holiness, Hazrat Mirza Masrur Ahmad, who is the worldwide spiritual head of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, the fifth, fifth successor to the Promised Messiah, alayhi salam. And he recently gave an address at the annual conference of Humanity First, which is based in the United Kingdom. And what stood out to me most about his amazing speech, and it's available on YouTube, it's in English, and there's a written transcript of it, and I encourage everybody to, to read it. A lot of the material that I just shared with you is from his address, actually. But one of the things that he has emphasized is that when we go on these trips, you can be a physician, you can be an engineer, or any, any specialty, uh, you should always uh, understand that you're replaceable and when you do these acts, it's nothing extraordinary or great on your part. It's actually a blessing of God that he's giving you that opportunity to partake in serving others because there's plenty of people who can serve. So we should never look at anything that we're doing as something extraordinary or great. It's an opportunity that God has blessed us with. And so he says, and I quote, never let any opportunity to serve those who are mired in poverty or sub subjected to hardship slip through your fingers and never, God forbid, allow even a trace of pride to enter your mind, thinking that you're doing s such people, uh, it, I think the quote is off there, a good service. Rather, it is they who are doing with you a favor because they are providing you with an opportunity to gain the pleasure of God and to reap his blessings both in this world and the next, unquote. So again, um, during this blessed month of Ramadan, uh, one of the hallmarks in Islam is serving others. 
And so this is one small way in which uh, people around the world, in Islam, in the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, in Humanity First, are trying to do their part to help others. At the very end, I'll be remiss if I don't mention the crisis that's happening in uh, Gaza, in Palestine. And you can see here that over 25,000 people have been killed in Palestine, and there's another 66,000 who are injured, 6,000 who are detained, and almost 2 million who have no homes and are displaced. Um, there's food insecurity, uh, there's problems with water and sanitation, there's people literally dying. And uh, most recently, Humanity First has started a campaign and they have volunteers on the ground in Gaza who are helping. So if you or anyone is interested in partaking and helping those who are victims of uh, the disaster that's happening in Palestine, you should certainly visit Humanity First. And uh, what's unique about Humanity First is that 93 cents of every dollar uh, goes towards the operations. There's, there's really nothing more uh, that your funds go towards, and these are very noble causes. And so uh, that is something that I hope you guys all consider. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hassan, for your uh, presentation. It's good to know what you do, actually. And I trust your judgment, so next time I'll make an appointment and come and see you. Uh, since we are on the subject of humanity first, I just wanted to introduce you to Mr. Jamil Mohammed. Mr. Jamil Mohammed is a native of Guyana, South Africa. He's a volunteer from Humanity First USA as country director of Humanity First Guyana since 2018. He is responsible for planning and sustaining all Humanity First programs in Guyana. Recently, he held a medical camp to provide medical help to the needy. I would let him explain the details. Please welcome Mr. Jamil. Assalamu alaikum and good evening. Thank you, Mr. Qureshi, for that kind introduction. There's a portion of my speech which is covered by Dr. Hassan. I'm not going to delete it. I'm going to repeat it. So please bear with me. Humanity First Guyana, a local arm of the global humanitarian organization, operates under the auspices of Humanity First USA. Founded in UK in 1994, registered in 1995, the parent body of Humanity First International is dedicated to serving humanity and upholding human dignity through diverse programs covering disaster relief, food security, health initiatives, education, water for life, and community care in 65 countries and growing. Humanity First Guyana was founded in 2004 after a devastating flood. Three 40-foot containers of clothing and medical supplies were donated from USA to assist the residents of the flooded areas. Incidentally, Guyana is a small English-speaking country of 820,000 residents located in the north coast of South America, not South Africa, <laughs> bordering Venezuela, Brazil, and Suriname. In 2018, I was appointed country director of Guyana. 12 other countries fall under the umbrella of Humanity First USA, Guyana being one of them. As country director, I am responsible to select the programs, prepare the budget, ensure that the approved funds are provided in a timely manner, vet and train the volunteers, and engage with influential figures, the best part of my job, such as president, the prime minister, cabinet ministers, mayors, law enforcement heads, and other key stakeholders. Humanity First Guyana is involved in a host of initiatives. Our food security program includes providing hot meals to the homeless and elderly, 
distributing thousands of meals and snacks to schools and delivering food hampers to orphans and elderly, as well as numerous deserving families, including those rendered helpless through contracting HIV. Through our education initiative, Humanity First Guyana serves part of the 40,000 Venezuelan and other Spanish-speaking uh, refugees via ESL, that is English as Second Language programs. We provide remote computer classes in prisons and underserved communities. We sponsor mental health lectures, career pathway guidance, resume writing, and medical advice to the residents there. Humanity First Guyana conducts medical outreaches in remote areas and cities, benefiting thousands with basic care and prescriptions, including free reading and prescription eyewear, donated mainly from USA, wheelchairs, walkers, and other health-related equipment. We collaborate with several medical service agencies, including the Ministry of Health, the Cancer Society, Diamond Optical, dental agencies, and mental health providers. The American Embassy, who last year provided two Cessna twin-engine planes to take medical supplies doctors and other volunteers to a very remote region of Guyana, partners with Humanity First Guyana throughout the year. Earlier this month, nine medical students and one physician visited Guyana for the first time through the Gift of Health program under Humanity First Student Organization from the University of Toledo, Ohio. They themselves financed these three medical camps by contributing $1,500 each, as well as the cost of their airfare, to selflessly serve 700 underprivileged patients. They all reported that they had thoroughly enjoyed time, enjoyed the time working directly with the patients, many of them meeting patients for the first time in their lives. Later in the week, they observed various procedures at the country's largest hospital and were graciously received by um, Ambassador Nicole Theriot at the American Embassy, where she thanked them for their services and encouraged them to work in Guyana when they graduate and provided them with certificates of completion. The team from USA and the core team from Guyana also had a one-hour session, a meaningful session, with the Prime Minister, Mark Phillips, at his office. He expressed gratitude for services we provided and made a generous cash donation for the second consecutive year to Humanity First Guyana. Several local doctors, nurses, medical students, two missionaries from the Ahmadiyya Muslim community of Guyana, <coughs> excuse me, and around 40 other volunteers of varying backgrounds contribute significantly to the success of Humanity First Guyana. Now, let's watch a very short video clip from the American ambassador, Nicole Theriot, who recently visited one of the medical outreaches in Guyana. Nicole Terrio, and I am very fortunate to be the U.S. Ambassador to Guyana. And I am here today uh, with Humanity First, who is doing an incredible mission here to provide uh, health care, counseling, testing, uh, eye, dental care for the people of Guyana. Uh, it's a wonderful opportunity for people to come out and free of charge, receive medical assistance, counseling, and testing. Um, this is something that is so needed here, and I'm just so grateful to Humanity First for being willing to do this, and they brought out a wonderful group of students from the United States, as well as a doctor from California, 
who is providing uh, the services. And we're partnered with the Ministry of Health here in Guyana, who are, have provided some wonderful uh, staff as well, nurses and doctors. Uh, so it's just a beautiful partnership and collaboration. Uh, and the U.S. Embassy, of course, is part of this. We help to, to coordinate the event. And uh, we are huge fans of Humanity First. We're hoping to work with them all over the world. And uh, of course, next year in the hinterlands of Guyana as well. So I just want to say thank you so much. And I'm so grateful for the partnership and collaboration that we have with Humanity First, the Ministry of Health, and the Amadea community here in Guyana. Thank you. All she was trying to tell you is how thankful she is with Humanity First for doing that camp. With that, I think there are so many other events that is happening under Humanity First. We don't have enough time to bring them all to your attention, but this was just the gist of it as we presented. And under Humanity First, um, not actually Humanity First, but under the umbrella of uh, Ahmadiyya Muslim community, we do a lot of work around the world as far as the legal issues are concerned. And now that brings me to the next presenter, Mr. Asif Arif. He is an attorney admitted to Paris and California Bar. He works closely with issues related to human rights and immigration law in U.S. and European courts. He is a member of the Amdia Muslim Lawyer Association. He will briefly explain how our community stands not only for violations of human, human rights concerning Amdi Muslims, but also concerning other minorities. With that said, please welcome Mr. Asif Arif. And Asif, you have just five minutes. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. May the peace and blessing of God be upon you all. Thank you to all the guests for attending tonight. I will try to be brief and uh, try to cover everything within five minutes, as it has been given to me. Uh, so our community from its inception have been persecuted, and that plays a very important role in how uh, we are positioning ourselves in the defense of uh, human rights. So before I dive a little bit more into different bodies that we have that plays the role for defending human rights, we need to be, you need to be aware of the amount and the degree of persecution that the Ahmadiyya Muslim community is facing. So the Ahmadiyya Muslim community has been founded by Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmad, peace be upon him, in Qadian, India in 1889. And right at the uh, beginning of its uh, of of this small community, the persecution have started. So I don't have the time to go a little bit more in detail about when and how they started. Uh, but the main two countries that I want to mention here for the persecution about for against the Ahmadiyya Muslim community are Pakistan and Algeria. Pakistan, because when I decided to, when I started studying law and I decided to become a lawyer, it played a crucial role in my identity as an Ahmadi Muslim for having this thought that we need to fight human rights in a way that would eventually benefit our community too. So in 1974, when uh, Pakistan has adopted what we call the Second Amendment to the Constitution, and uh, in this amendment, member of our community, the Ahmadi Muslims have been deemed as non-Muslim, considered as non-Muslim. So you need to understand that everybody here as Ahmadi Muslim, we pray the same way that Muslim prays. We do exactly the same. We have the same faith. We have the same six pillar of faith, as we call them, as other Muslims have. Uh, but in, under the Pakistani rules, we are deemed as non-Muslim. This identity of uh, as Muslim has been taken off from us. And that is going a, even a little bit more ahead when we think about the Ordinance 20 that has been adopted later on, which include a statute into the Pakistani Criminal Code uh, saying that any ritual or uh, any practice that would have that would go as there will be a as other Muslim will do, 
or if we pose as Muslim, this is the exact terminology of the ordinance, we will be subject to fine, jail, and uh, some, in some area, we are also called what we call vajibul qatal, meaning eligible for death. So this is the environment in which a lot of our Muslim, uh, Ahmadi Muslim attorneys are working uh, today. I would like to mention one specific person today uh, who is not here among us, but doing an extremely dangerous and extremely brave work in Pakistan, who is attorney Usman Karamuddin Sahib. The second uh, country that I wanted to mention is Algeria. Algeria, because it's a little bit more modern, it's a little bit more recent in terms of persecution. It started in 2012. Uh, in Algeria, the persecutions are close to be similar than Pakistan, where Algerian government has adopted a law. It's called the Law for Intellectual Property of Islam putting a stamp on what and how you should practice Islam. So any other school of thought, any other way of practicing is considered illegal. So it touched it directly our community because uh, they consider us as non-Muslim and started doing some operation of crackdown against our different mission houses or different uh, places of worship and they dissolve also our association there. I tried to go to Algeria, but for some reason, uh, the minister of uh, the, w when I spoke with my, the counterpart in Algeria for France, at that time I was living in, in, in France, uh, he said, uh, our uh, counterpart in Algeria is seeing your visit with extremely worrisome because accident happened a lot in Algeria. This is sometimes how uh, um, attorneys in our community have to work and I didn't went there but a lot of attorneys there work and uh, the main attorney for our community has to in fact uh, claim asylum into another country and leave Algeria uh, a little bit after. Um, in uh, many countries uh, Ahmadis uh, will, will also suffer persecution but the response from our leaders, whether the past caliph or the current caliph, Hazrat Mirza Masur Ahmad, may God be his helpers, has always been the same. Condemnation of the persecutions, advocate for peace, and uh, establish peace around the world, no retaliation is allowed, and no opposition to the government is allowed. Ahmadi Muslim are often required and always required, sorry, to constantly pray and ameliorate their spiritual state. Now, it is one thing to say that Ahmadi Muslims are being persecuted and uh, we have attorneys that defend our case, uh, but Ahmadi Muslims are at the forefront for defending other minorities too. We uh, recently, uh, in the introduction, Fatih Qureshi I mentioned the work uh, that has been done by our, the National Secretary of Public Affairs, Amjad Memul Khan, about uh, the defense of other minorities, specifically about Rohingyas or about Uyghurs or other. Uh, we have also internally an Ahmadiyya Muslim Lawyer Association that work for indigenous people as well, for upholding their rights and make sure that they have the rights that they deserve under the human rights and conventions. Um, this is uh, also another point that I wanted to make in this presentation is that some prominent figure of our community, here you can see Sir Chodzi Rafullah Khan Sahib, who used to be the former, he was a, a president of the General Assembly of the United Nations, is speaking with President Kennedy here on this picture, and he was also advocating for all religious minority to be able to practice their faith uh, with, without regard of their faith or creed. This is also one of the unique feature of this community that not only we, again, defend human rights when it comes to Ahmadis, but also for other communities. It comes to the last point that I wanted to bring here in this presentation, I hope I stay within my five minutes, uh, which is the theme of tonight is the voices for peace. And uh, what I wanted to mention here is that ultimately for us Ahmadi Muslim, the ultimate voice for peace is His Holiness Hazrat Mirza Masur Ahmad. 
And uh, our caliph is, uh, has a very unique way of defending those who are being oppressed. First of all, before being elected caliph, he went to jail specifically on the base of these ordinances that I mentioned earlier in Pakistan. So he knows very well how injustice is and how is it to feel to be treated unjustly. But how did he reply since he became a caliph? First, and you see it in the introduction video, he, he participated and every year he is the keynote speaker for peace symposiums. During these peace symposiums, he always called for, for the betterment of humanity to understand the rights of our fellow human being. Then he wrote many, many letters to dignitaries uh, about the current situation of the world. Finally, uh, His Holiness has many, many speeches in world-known institutions, including the Capitol Hill here in the United States, the European Parliament, UNESCO, and other different uh, world institutions. And he speaks again about these few elements that I will talk about and conclude this presentation. His Holiness said that leaders should act with wisdom, putting aside their personal interests invested uh, in vested interest for the sake of establishing peace. He said also peace cannot be achieved without moral and recognizing the ultimate power of God, the Almighty, to whom being all belongs and all shall return. And finally, no peace can be established without absolute justice, and the justice starts on a smaller scale in your house, in your community, and then extend to bigger circles such as county, region, and state level, and eventually international level. And every of those level should adopt peace and justice. So this was the small presentation that I wanted to present in front of you. And since it's being a blessed month of Ramadan, I uh, will end with this uh, prayer that may Allah the Almighty help us to achieve these noble tasks that our Caliph has put upon us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Asif Arif, uh, for briefing us what you do as far as the legal affairs are concerned. Uh, these were just the examples of how um, the Muslim community raises our voices for peace, meeting with the dignitaries, leaders of the world, writing them letters, going to them and pleading the case for the war to stop and to make sure the innocent lives are not suffering anymore. This is some of the ways we participate in raising our voices for peace. I, initially, I mentioned uh, that we normally, every year we go to Capitol Hill to meet with the lawmakers and every time we go, uh, we have a different experience. This year, uh, we have uh, a young gentleman who is serving as the president of one of the subchapters of Amdiya Muslim community in Los Angeles, had the opportunity to go visit our uh, Capitol Hill and meet with the congressmen and the senators. And the experience he had, it just reminds me like a kid in a candy store. He was so excited. So I thought it will be a good thing if we can share his thoughts and you can hear him firsthand, his experience on the Capitol Hill. With that, I will invite Muhammad Abdul Momin Saab to please come on the podium and share some thoughts with you. Dear distinguished guests, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Peace be upon you as well as the mercy of God and his blessings. I have been asked to share my experience with you on what I gained from day on the, on the Capitol Hill event. The event occurred on the January 29, 2024, organized by Ahmadiyya Muslim Community USA. There are more than 90 Ahmadi, Ahmadiyya members that gathered from 59 chapters all over the USA together at Capitol Hill advocating for international religious freedom causes, particularly lending their 
voices on behalf of beleaguered Ahmadiyya Muslim in Pakistan and in Palestine. As part of annual day on the Hill project, Ahmadi delegates from around the country meet with more than 120 members of Congress or their staff in Washington, D.C. to encourage support for a ceasefire in Gaza and a sustained path to peace in Gaza to avoid further deaths, famine, humanitarian catastrophe in the region. The delegates also brought attention to the rights of Ahmadiyya Muslim in Pakistan, where constitution forbids Ahmadis from calling themselves Muslim. And penal code imposes the death penalty uh, for Ahmadis who practice their uh, faith freely. We ask members of Congress to urge the government of Pakistan to take immediate action to protect Ahmadi Muslim cause uh, cease, uh, cease precautions against them under blasphemy law and anti Ahmadi laws. Restore their right to vote fully and freely and condemn any violence against them. I was able to discuss the ongoing situation in Pakistan and Gaza with Danny Hartel, legislative officer of uh, Representative Ken Calvert at Capitol Hill in DC. I also met with Neil Rosalini, Deputy Chief of Staff of Representative Jimmy Gomez. So for our 70 members of Congress support a Gaza ceasefire, and the number is still growing. We share the message of our spiritual leader, His Holiness Mirza Mustur Ahmad, to every congressional office. There can be no true and lasting peace in Gaza without justice, justice and fairness for Palestinians. The International Religions Freedom Summit held a special event after with the members of Congress, 180 faith leaders, public officials, and experts gathered to reflect on interfaith models for peace building and reconciliation. In the summit, Director of Public Affairs, Ahmadiyya Muslim Community, USA, Amjad Mahmoud Khan says, quote it, we advocate for the rights of each other as much as our own. In fact, we are a voice for others and by showing that common humanity we are then stronger as an international religion freedom movement, and therefore, international religion freedom is stronger." Unquote. Among guests, there were President Biden's United States Ambassador for International Religion Freedom, Rashad Hussain, who delivered the opening remarks. There, there were three distinguished panels. The first panel featuring Mohammed Sharif Odeh from Haifa, Israel, Rabbi Ahron Lavi from uh, Israel as well, and Archbishop Amber Angelus of the Captive Orthodox Church in London discussed interfaith efforts to build peace in Israel and Palestine. It was a very interesting and extraordinary opportunity for me to be able to attend this unique event and the panel discussion were very well received by all those audience and attendees, especially given the urgent need to end the horrific violence that is unfolding in Palestine. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you, Thank you very much, Mr. Momin, for sharing your experience in Washington, D.C. Now this leads me to uh, another next speaker, a great friend, friend of mine, Barry E. Knight. As a minister and servant leader, Mr. Knight frequently speaks and writes on a subject such as vision clarity, transformational leadership, team, team culture, and identity growing in faith, hope and belief discovering and succeeding in your purpose. Him and his wife, Sachin, Erica, Knight are the proud parents of two sons, BJ, who is 18, Charlie Edwards, 15, and one daughter, Sydney Erica, 10. 
It is Bernie's desire to live life and die empty, fulfilling everything that God has placed him on this earth to do. Mr. Knight is the author of book, The Gift Called Leadership, How the Leader's Pre Presence Empowers Others to Succeed. Mr. Knight also serves as Equity Access and Opportunity Officer for the County of Riverside. His work includes working with department leaders and analysts to identify and implement solutions to eliminate barriers and disparity for vulnerable and under, undeserved communities and improve the quality of life for the people. I just wanted to remind Barry he is a priest and he would take all the time in the world to keep going, but Barry, please, where are you? Five minutes. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Good evening to you all. It's a pleasure to be here, and I greet you with grace, peace, and blessings to all my brothers and sisters. You know, walking in here, I must say, this is the first time I've ever been into a mosque. And I walked in, and I felt loved. I felt like I am a part of the community, like I am a brother. I didn't assume that wrong, did I? I, I am a brother, am I? Okay, I just wanted to make sure. Uh, just briefly, obviously, I have five minutes, and as a pastor, I can, can talk a long time. <laughs> September 12th was a very important time in our life, September 12, 2001, because it was a time that we all came together. September 11th, the day before, each of us can remember where we were, what we were doing in that time, at that moment, very vividly and specifically, we can remember. But it was September 12th where there was no party line. There was no elephant or donkeys. There were no red or blues. It was the most beautiful thing of Americans coming together. But my friends, I pray that we do not have, have to have another tragedy to bring us together to be one. It's oftentimes in America that we come together in solidarity once a tragedy has breached our country. And I'm just praying and believing that this is a time that we can begin just starting with this group. I don't know if you know, but when you study history, it never took, not, uh, movements did not begin with thousands of people. They begin with small groups of people who were concerned about a larger humanity, a larger purpose, who were concerned with a larger focus than themselves, who came together and said, we cannot stand to see things as they are anymore. And I'm just a believer in change. Call it Pollyanna. Maybe it's fana fantasy thinking. But I believe that we can actually bring change to our world, and I'm going to just share a few things. I'm very honored, Vati, for the opportunity and also to share from a Christian perspective with my brothers here. I saw here the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, and underneath it says United States of America. And that part that got me was the community and the united. And that's what I kind of want to just share with you. Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, Jesus said that blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. The Apostle Paul writes in Galatians 5, 22 through 23, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, it's joy, it's peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. We're talking about uh, this theme today is Voices of Peace. And we often talk about praying for peace. Pray for peace. Pray for peace in America. Well, let me help you out here. You can't pray for something that you are not. And so before we pray for peace, my request, my admonition to each and every one of you all is to be at peace. Let me say it again. Before we pray for peace, for America. My prayer for all of us in here is that we would be at peace within ourselves, within our family, within our community, 
for our young people. I love that our young people are here. In your schools, be at peace. In our districts, in our, in, in our cities, in our state, in our regions, in our county, be at peace. I cannot pray for something that I haven't received for myself. I've been married 20 years and I kept asking God, God, change her, change her. She's wrong. And finally, God had to minister to me and said, I can't change her until I first change you. And that's where we're going to begin, the change that's going to happen in our country and around the world. Great travesty that we've witnessed on the news. And I'm just a person in every role that I play, and I play quite a bit of roles, is to find out what can I do to first bring peace. And, and I'll say this last thing. For those of us here in America, we are dealing with the political split, even war, if you want to call it, within America. And I'm even praying that we'll have politicians and civic leaders that speak from the platform of, of peace. I haven't heard it yet. I've heard attacks. But what America needs now is we need voices of peace who live in peace. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barry. I just forgot to mention that Barry uh, is a writer. He writes books. At one point, we both started writing one book together. I mean, two different books. And by the way, Barry, I was keeping trap, and I have sold mine more than yours. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, with that, I am going to introduce to our Imam Kausar, Imam of the Amdia Muslim community, Southern California. He was born in New York, grew up here in Chino, California, after completing a seven years course in Islamic theology and comparative study of religions at the Amdia Seminary School in Toronto. He began serving the mission as an Imam in Tanzania before settling in the Pacific Islands. Man, those are big words where he served for nearly five years. He also served as chairman of faith-based organizations under UN presence in Kiribati Islands. In 2018, he began serving the greater New York City area, heading four mosques in and around the city. During his time in New York, a street was co-named Amdia Way, and construction began for the largest Amdia Mosque minaret in Northern America, North America. He has been serving Southern California chapters of Amdia Muslim community since July of 22. Imam Mahmoud Qasr has been tremendously involved in the community trying to foster brotherhood, building relations, and interfaith leaders, and being actively involved in youth program. Please welcome Imam Qasr. <laughs> Thank you very much to Mr. Fateh Qureshi. Again, it's not easy to give some remarks right after a pastor, but I'll give it a go. I will uh, recite a few words in Arabic just for the blessings of beginning. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika la wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh. Amma ba'du fa'uzu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim The theme that I was given as the closing remarks was voices for peace achieving sustainable peace through absolute justice and I'm supposed to do that in 5 minutes so bear with me let me start off with the fact that we are in the blessed month of Ramadan. It is a holy month for Muslims around the globe. All billion of us are trying our best to improve ourselves in our lives, try to shackle the Satan within, making sure that we make all kinds of strives in a way that we improve our lives, improve the lives of those around us. 
It is a personal pursuit for 30 days. Each and every Muslim who is sitting on your right and left right now is striving for the same goal, the goal of making an inner transformation, a change from within, but not a temporary change, a lasting, sustainable, and permanent change. There's a saying of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, on whom be peace. He says that when you see injustice, you should use your hand to cause meaningful change. And if you can't change the thing with your own hand, then you should use your tongue. And if you can't use your tongue, you can't voice your concerns about a matter, then at least allow your heart to settle the score. Make sure that your heart feels that such an injustice is wrong. And of course, pray. If we were to look at the blessed month of Ramadan, all three of these elements exist to teach in each and every Muslim around the world and the rest of the world as well about how we can cause meaningful change. Let's start with the lowest degree, our heart. Ramadan's essence is that you take the element of sympathy and you transform it into empathy. Sympathy is from a far distance, we feel bad for them. I feel bad for that homeless man who doesn't have a place to sleep, for that hungry family that doesn't have any food to eat. I feel bad, no doubt. But I'm sitting in a distance in my nice car as I drive by. Ramadan says no, Islam says no. It's not enough to cause change if you simply have sympathy. You have to have empathy, you have to feel that pain. So now all Muslims must wake up early in the morning before the sun comes out, have a brief breakfast, and then fast for the entire day. Fear, feel the hunger that somebody else might feel. Embrace the empathy that is ingrained in this teaching. I can imagine many of us are looking at the clock right now, wondering when we'll open our fast. We've been here for almost two hours. So yes, this is where you feel that pain, the empathy for all those who are hungry and suffering around the globe. Millions of people, forget millions of people, people here in LA alone. There are so many who are probably hungry as you speak right now. That is the purpose. It is to make sure that our hearts never become numb to the concept or to the pain of others. Similarly, we should always acknowledge that, that heart or the aspect of the heart is just the first step. The next step is the tongue. How do we create change, meaningful change from our tongue? And again, Islam is so beautiful that Ramadan is closely, if not directly tied to the Holy Quran, the Muslim holy book. And when the Holy Quran began its revelation, Angel Gabriel came to the Prophet Muhammad, on whom be peace, in, on a mountain, in a cave, and said, Ikra, recite. Recite in the name of your Lord who created you. And not only created you, but taught man and woman by the pen. Meaning, the greatest innovation, the greatest accomplishment of mankind is not the fact that we can speak. Other animals can speak. It's the fact that we can write. It's the fact that we can safeguard our treasures from time and time again. We can teach one another. We don't have to be present at that time to teach somebody, we can write it down. And it was through writing that meaningful change began from day one, especially in the realm of Islam. The same is true with our Voices for Peace campaign. This was launched by the worldwide head of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. And the objective was let's bring like-minded activists together to raise Voices for Peace. If we do so, then we can cause true peace by voicing our concerns by writing. For example, many of our community members, when the Gaza conflict began, it became a situation where children and women were being killed, civilians were being attacked. We thought it would be the best thing then 
many months ago to have a ceasefire. So what did we do? Each and every one of us, many of the children who are sitting next to you, even they sat together and we began writing letters. We wrote to Joe Biden. We wrote to all kinds of politicians, congresswomen, congressmen, different leaders of this country, everybody we could possibly think of so that we could cause meaningful change. And it just so happened about three days ago, I received a letter signed by Joe Biden himself. And he acknowledged that we wrote to him. And he said a few kind words about his administration's goal to cause, to bring about some meaningful change. I didn't see the word ceasefire, so I'm gonna to write to him again. But that's the point, is we have the ability to continue to write, continue to cause that change. If we don't, let's acknowledge for a fact that around the world today, there are countless conflicts. And sitting in America in our comfort, we sometimes forget. Just to name a few, there's an instability in Haiti, Lebanon, Afghanistan, war in Ukraine, Yemen. There's a conflict between Turkey and Kurdish groups. There's a conflict in Syria. There's a civil conflict in Libya, Ethiopia, Congo. There's a civil war in Sudan, Myanmar, Israel and Palestine. There's territorial disputes in South China. Many of us might feel that these are distant conflicts. Why does it matter to us? But we have to remember it's shaped by the policies, the decisions, the positions, the interests, the relations, the actions, and inactions of the leaders of all superpowers, especially the fact that you and I live in the most powerful nation on the face of this earth, with the largest military influence on a global scale. That is why we have a direct obligation to speak truth to power. We're doing that today. In fact, that's where the call of action comes. It's not enough to speak up. Remember I mentioned to you, change with your own hand. It doesn't mean punch somebody or use a fist, but it means do the work, bring action. Don't just talk. Talk is cheap. So. I want to acknowledge and thank everybody because your being here was that first step of action. Thank you. Your raising a voice was another step of action. And the last thing is remember that once you leave here, continue to raise awareness in the people or the influences that you have, the circles of influence. That is the only way we can start this grassroots movement of trying to create meaningful change towards a better world. We should continue to write to our politicians because what I've noticed and what our Khalifatul Masih, the worldwide head of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community continuously says is that many people are ignoring the fact that they were headed on this dark path. The trajectory is leading to some global world war. In fact, he commented, he said either due to their idealism and a desire to look at the world through rose-tinted glasses, or perhaps due to an incompatibility to learn lessons from history. People seemingly ignore the widening cracks that have been opening up in recent decades in international relations. Perhaps they simply did not wish to accept the reality of what was staring them in the face. As they say, ignorance is bliss. Many still seem unwilling to consider what must be done to end these conflicts and remain reluctant to hear the genuine voices for peace that exist in the world. The reality of it is, is that we have all forgotten the effects of the last world war. 70 million people died, most of whom were civilians. So the goal at the end of the day, the goal has to be how we attain peace. It is attainable, but you and I have to care about it enough. There's a number of people we invited tonight. They didn't choose to come. The title was Voices for Peace. They didn't see fit to attend this program today. 
You did. The reason I say that is because sometimes we're distracted. Sometimes we forget. And it reminds me of a famous Beatles singer, John Lennon. He once said, if everyone demanded peace instead of another television set, then there'd be peace. And that's the reality of it. We're distracted by the newest iPhone, the new trinkety thing that comes out, and we're forgetting that we need to demand peace. We need to want peace, not only in our homes, not only in our towns, but globally speaking. And that is why some principles that are set by Islam, I want to share with you briefly as we wrap up today. These were quoted by the worldwide head of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community in the same address that we heard early in this day. He says in chapter 42, verse 41 of the Holy Quran, God commands that where a person or nation has been wronged, they must never respond disproportionately or stray into realms of seeking revenge. In fact, God says that it's better to forgive it can, if it can lead to reformation. Another chapter of the Holy Quran says that if two nations are at war, neutral parties should mediate between them and strive to establish peace on the principles of justice and equity. He further says, if having reconciled, one party violates the terms of the agreement and again resorts to warfare, other nations should forcefully unite against the aggressor until it desists from its aggressive conduct. Once it stops, the other nations must also cease using force. The objective should always remain to build sustainable peace underpinned by justice. It should not be that a third party takes advantage of the vulnerability of the warring parties by usurping their rights for their own benefit. These can apply to some of the lists of conflicts that I shared with you earlier. But unfortunately, we're seeing that the UN, which was designed to save the world from another catastrophic world war, has similarly headed down a path like the League of Nations, with the vote veto rights and so many other Ill elements there that have crippled its ability to create peace and justice around the world. That is why it's critical for you and I to speak up. This is what Islam teaches us. We have to raise voices for peace. So I end again with a glimmer of hope. Let's continue to share our voices for everlasting peace so that a day comes in our lives that we're able to enjoy that peace together. Inshallah, God willing, Amin. Again, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. May God bless you all. May God bless you for joining us, for coming out here. We will, God willing, be able to serve some dinner to you. We will enjoy that meal, and that will be where we'll have this conversation continue, inshallah. With that few words, I would now have what we know, what we call a silent prayer. Each and every one of us can pray in their own words, in their own way in which they would like to beseech God or the cause of all causes in whatever way they see fit but we will give a few moments for us to pray please join me in a silent prayer dua Ameen, Allahumma Ameen. So we're a few minutes until the breaking of the fast, so everybody can begin speaking to one another. There will be a point when you will hear the call for the prayer. That will be the cue to have some of the dates that are sitting in front of you and drink some water as well. After which we will take a quick break for prayer. Uh, many of the members will be joining me uh, inside the prayer hall. Anyone else who is interested to see how Muslims pray, uh, if you'd like to come and see in the men's side, if there are ladies who would like to see the ladies' side, are welcome to do so as well. And then after the prayer, we'll come and enjoy our iftar dinner. Thank you again very much.